to make to have this on our page for later viewing. And I wanna introduce you to Diana. Um, as the current gifted and talented resource coordinator for Jefferson County Schools in Colorado, Diana works with her team to ensure that programming, identification, and professional learning are geared towards student success at all levels. At the state level, Diana is the immediate past president of the Colorado Association for Gifted and Talented. She holds an administrative license, a teaching credential, and is GT endorsed. And I just have to tell you personally, she was a wonderful mentor to me when I came into Jeffco, and I'm so excited to see her. So tonight she's going to be talking about executive function through their eyes, and it's going to be a presentation to support students in building their executive functioning skills. She'll share both classroom and home resources and share with us some easy tools so that kids can be successful. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Diana. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Well, hello, everyone. I am really happy to be here today. Um, the resources for this presentation come from a variety of very special people in the fields of educate, executive function and gifted education. These resources are listed at the end of my presentation and now executive function through their eyes. And uh, hopefully, Jessica, you can kind of keep me on track with time. Um, I love Jessica Howard. I'm super happy to be here with her tonight. I'm actually coming to you tonight from the Oregon coast out in Depot Bay. Um, where I work remotely for um, a school district. So here we go. Executive function through their eyes. Hopefully you can see my screen okay. Yes, it's wonderful. Okay. Um, so um, Jessica, on this one in the chat, since I can't see the Facebook chat, um, um, if, if you could have people write down one thing you know about executive function. Maybe you can kind of tell me some of the things that people put in there. If you I will me. definitely do that. Why don't we take a, a little bit of time here just to just write down quickly something that you know about executive function. And please share in the um, Facebook comment section and I can I can share it with Diana. going to talk a little bit about what executive function is in a minute. I just was hoping that we could get some people putting some good their thoughts in there. Do you have anything, Jessica? Um, organizational skills. That's a big one. And hello, good morning from Malaysia. <laughs> Malaysia. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to talk a little bit about some of these skills and what executive function is in just a minute. So let's Go ahead and move on. One of the most important things when we're working with students, and I've been in education for over 30 years, is building that relationship with students, really understanding who they are, why they're doing what they're doing, and remembering that students don't want to be that student in class that you're saying, that Johnny did this again. They really do want to make you happy. They're not doing things intentionally to make you angry for the most part. Um, so you really wanna build that relationship with them and make sure that you are understanding who they are as people as, as, as they're going as in your classroom and, at, and also in your home. Finding the cause of something, the root cause of something is really in one of the key pieces to finding the right tools and the right resources to meet students' needs. So with problem identification, what is the problem? Is the problem that the student can't get, get their homework turned in? And let's talk about that problem analysis. Why is that occurring? Is it that they don't understand the assignment? Are they having trouble organizing their supplies? Do they forget to turn it in? And then thinking about that plan, plan implementation, what can we do about it? Those are some of the things that we're gonna talk about today. And I'll give you some of those tools and ideas to support what we can do about it. Um, and then taking the time to evaluate that plan. Did it work? 
Are we actually use, utilizing tools and giving them a chance um, to make them work um, with consistency um, as you're going through that whole problem solving process? Executive function skills help your brain to, when you have strong executive function skills, it helps your brain to demonstrate situational awareness, practice, predict possible outcomes, recall things, generate plans to achieve something, initiate appropriate actions or responses to situations, you need to monitor how that's going, how that plan is going, is it working? Is it failing? Um, is your behavior one of one that is, is helping your plan to succeed? And if not, how do you modify that performance based on that self-monitoring and situational awareness to get that expected outcome as opposed to those unexpected outcomes? And how do you shift flexibly between activities? There are eight key executive function skills. I'm like gonna talk about each one and kind of give you an idea of how that might look. So the first one is impulse control. Impulse control helps your child think before acting. So if they have weak impulse control, they might blur out unexpected things or inappropriate things. They might engage in risky behavior. Skill two is that emotional control. It helps your child keep their feelings in check. If they, have, if they don't have strong emotional control, they might overact to something or have trouble dealing with criticism or regrouping if something goes wrong. You know how that can feel when they overreact for something that you think that was something that wasn't that big a deal, you would think, and they overreact to it. That's when they might have weaker emotional control. Flexible thinking really allows your child to adjust to the unexpected. What happens when that fire drill goes off in class? Or what happens when the teacher isn't in class for the day? How is the child going to react to that? Um, are they able to roll with the punches? Are they gonna get frustrated when something happens a little bit differently? If they're expecting to do something on a certain day and that, that plan changes, how are they gonna to react to that? Skill four is working memory. That's when it, this working memory is going to help your child understand key information, keep that stuff in their, in their brain. Um, kids with weak working memory have trouble remembering directions, and, and it doesn't matter whether you've told them 15 times, you might say, hey, I've told you that five times and you're still not following those directions. It's because they have weak working memory. And even if they've taken notes, sometimes they may have trouble remembering what it is that they need to do. I'm gonna show you, um, oops, I'm sorry, went the wrong way here. Number five, skill number five is self-monitoring. So that's an evaluating what they're doing, making sure that they understand that they, um, are maybe on the wrong track or on the right track. So really evaluating themselves and what skills need to be done to accomplish whatever it is. So kids with weak self-monitoring skills, they might be surprised if they get a C on a paper that they thought that they were doing okay on. Or if someone says, wow, you, you know, this, you, know you, you didn't do a good job on this when they really thought that they were doing okay. They haven't been self-monitoring themselves. Skill six is that planning and prioritizing. And I hear a lot of times from the teachers I work with and parents that that planning and prioritizing is such a big deal that, they, that their child can't remember or don't, doesn't plan ahead or doesn't prioritize to get a goal completed or a project completed or a homework assignment completed. So kids with weak planning and prioritizing skills may not realize what's most important or what part might take longer than another part to get it completed. Task initiation is really just, can your child get started? Can your student get started with whatever project it is in front of them? And um, it's, that, it's that child that's sitting in your classroom and they can't, they can't, they have their pencil in their hand and they can't decide what to do or how to get started. Um, they may freeze up and not have any idea of where to begin. And I, I mean, I find that sometimes myself with certain tasks, I look around thinking, oh, it's going to take me forever to do whatever it is. But I notice once I get started, then it gets, you get it done quickly. And that's true with kids too. Giving them some key skills or some key tools to help them get started and get them over that uh, first initial reaction of freezing up when they can't decide 
what to do or can't figure out how to begin on something. That skill aid is that organization piece, letting your child keep track of things physically and mentally or having that ability to keep track of things physically or mentally so they can lose train their lose their train of thought or their homework or their cell phone or whatever else it may be. And I think a really important piece to all of this is all of us have executive function skills. This is not something that is just students that are having difficult as adults we have difficulty with these things as well. These are skills that need to be learned. These are skills that can be taught. These are skills that we are, some of us are better at organization and not so good at task initiation and so forth. This, our students are the same, our children are the same. So what we can do, and what I'm gonna show you today is, are just some tools and some things that may help with some of those pieces. Um, it's important to identify, like we showed with that root cause diagram, what it is exactly that your student or your child is having trouble with. Is it task initiation? Is it just that organization piece? Is it a variety of pieces um, that they're having issues with? This um, diagram here is simply just another way of looking at it. It's a visual representation of those executive functioning skills um, because this will be something that you guys can look up later on. I was thinking that this might be a way for some people to really um, understand what executive functioning is in another way of looking at it. Now, when we, um, this is through the eyes of someone with executive functioning deficits. So a common task like, oh, go clean your room, a, a child or an adult would go into that room and just think, I, I don't know where to begin. This is overwhelming. I have no idea how to start. And you can, you can see how that could be totally overwhelming for, uh, for anyone. Um, one of the ways that you can deal with that piece is to start small. Start with one thing. Start with a specific task, one thing at a time. So, for example, in a room like this, you might say, let's get all the books together and put the books on the shelf. Start with one task and help the child understand that one task after one task leads to the project getting completed. But mom, all you said was get all your stuff off the floor. And actually they did what they were asked to do in this case. Visualization is um, an important way for students to understand that our children to understand that they, if they can start visualizing the project completed or they can start seeing what it looks like when it's done or they can start giving themselves that self-talk and saying, this is what I want it to look like when it's done um, can really help them. Um, so that self-monitoring is a key skill in developing those executive function um, pieces. Um, Self-stopping, knowing when to monitor, knowing when to stop, seeing the future. Um, what, is, what am I gonna look like when it's done? How am I gonna feel like when I'm done? What is a project gonna look like when it's done? Say in the future, if I do this, then this is what's going to occur, or then this is what's going to happen with this project in the future. And then how are you gonna feel? How are you gonna feel when that project's done? And really teaching our, our children these skills. Let's talk about what self-monitoring is. How, how can we practice self-monitoring at home? How can we play with the future? How can we feel the future and practice some of those skills? Visualization is a positive way to do that. Sarah Ward talks a lot about um, miming it. Um, it's important ex uh, because executive function doesn't start with verbal memory. It starts with that temporal spatial nonverbal memory, which develops before language skills. So how can we mime it? How can we make an image? What's it going to look like? What am I going to look like when that's completed? How will I be moving to make that happen? What do I need to be doing physically to make that happen? How am I going to feel when that happens? Um, and then back to that talk that if then self talk, let's talk a little bit about that. So, so thinking about visualization, actually putting yourself in that place, actually doing emotions, doing the actions to make something happen and visualizing that for yourself and for a project to get done. If then and self talk is supportive of those social emotional needs that our students have, our children have. 
we really want to have that hands-on learning, that positive self-talk. We don't have positive self-talk. A lot of times that self-talk is going to turn into a negative place. Like I'm so stupid, I can't get this done. I have too much to do, um, those kinds of things. But if we can turn that into a positive self-talk and practice and teach our students that it will help with those social emotional um, learning pieces and those social emotional skills for our students. So for example, if you can't find the outfit you're looking for, then what do you do? How are you gonna self-talk your way through that? Then I'll do this. If you can't find your homework that's due today, then what are you going to do? Let's talk about the self-talk that goes with that. What can you say to yourself in these situations? And these are, again, all of these things that we're talking about here are learned behaviors and they're things that you need to practice with your student and your child. Some of the skills that are learning that we want to make sure that we support with our executive functioning skills are being ready for the day. How do we get those morning routines going when we get out of the house? How do we transition from home to school or at school between class to class or, be, or within a class between um, being sitting at my desk and, and doing math to transitioning to reading or another um, area within the classroom or transitioning from the classroom to recess or lunch, things like that. How am I going to manage those materials? I'm going to, how am I going to make sure that I bring my homework home and it comes back to school again with me the next day? How am I going to make sure that the materials in my desk are organized so I can find things that are not spread across halfway across the classroom? How am I going to see that, make sure that I'm completing my work on time and doing it in a, in a, in a, in an organized way and getting that turned in again. With homework, how am I getting those assignments home with, the, with understanding what needs to be accomplished? How am I getting that, that work done at home and then getting it returned to school and put where it needs to be at school? If I'm studying for a project or something like that, how am I organizing my time? How am I chunking that work into something that um, is manageable for me? If I am studying for a long-term, for a test or a long-term assignment, how am I gonna organize those notes so that I understand what I really need to know and understand in order to do well on the test? And again, for that project, how am I laying out my plan or out my schedule so that I'm making sure that I don't procrastinate and put too much stuff off or making sure that I have that due date and not trying to complete the thing the day before it's actually done. So really organizing that calendar, organizing that, um, those, uh, those um, materials, organizing my time, organizing where I'm gonna do the project, um, making sure that I have this, the support I need from, from home if I need that or from, from school if I need that as well. And all of this is really about understanding really what's expected of yourself as well. When struggling with executive functioning skills, Creating those habits and routines are the key for students to feel that sense of control. Let's talk about how they can do those kinds of things. Situational awareness is that space, time, objects, people. You want students to learn how to read a room. Where am I? What's going on? Is this expected? Is this unexpected? What is the time of day? Is this the time I'm supposed to be doing math? Is this the time that I'm supposed to be doing something else? What's happening at this moment in time? And then what's coming up? If I'm here and I know that I'm supposed to be finishing this one task, then what do I need to be doing next? And that's the same thing at home. If I'm supposed to be finishing this one task at home, then what's the next thing that I'm supposed to be doing? So coming up with those predictable sequences and what pace is required? Do I need to hurry up? Do I need to, am I okay at the pace I'm going? Do I need to plan something a little bit differently or schedule something a little bit differently or organize my time in a different way? And then that organization, how are things organized around me? How are my things organized? So is it, is it, um, it are, my, are the items I need with me in front of me? Do I have all the materials I need? Do I have my plan book? Um, and then that, just think of, thinking about that location and the purpose for those objects and what am I gonna, what am I gonna do with those things? And how am I gonna get those interacting? Um, how am I gonna interact with those objects to make sure that I complete whatever the assignment is? And then reading the person, the people around me, face, body, appearance, mood. What are people saying around me? What are their face? What are their body, um, body, their actions and things like that? How are they, what's their mood? 
read the people around me and, and think about yourself as well in that situational awareness. How am I feeling? Um, how, how, what, how, what's my mood? So understanding yourself through this process as well. I'll talk a little bit about backwards planning. Backwards planning is, again, based on that visualization or based on that understanding of what needs to be done so that you can plan the things to get it done. Sarah Ward uses a get ready, do, done um, format that we have had used it multiple times to get this, to get to help students. And it can be done at all ages, which I think is a really important part. Um, we start with the red box. What will it look like when it's done? And, and really having them think out loud and, and talk about what that's gonna look like when it's done. How am I gonna feel when it's done? And it can be literally, can, they could draw a picture of it. They can write the words down. Um, and then starting with, and then going from the done section to the get ready. So in order to get that done, what am I gonna need to get ready? Am I going to need pencil and paper books? What are you gonna need? And really thinking out loud and talking about those things that you need to have in order to get it done. And then you move into the do. So it's really figuring out the done, get your ready stuff, get your supplies ready, and then actually doing it. And then at the do stuff, Again, make those brief one to two steps that need to be done. How long is it going to take? How much time am I going to need? And so forth. This is another way of looking at this. Um, we have a clock at the top, so you can actually put the amount of time that it's going to take to get something done. Um, and, then, and then really that self-reflection. When I'm done, I'm going to feel, oh, how am I gonna feel? Does my body need anything before I start? Really but thinking about that self-reflection too and talking about that with your, your child, your student. Using pictures is a great way of showing students. And I would actually recommend taking a picture of your child and, and utilizing a checklist such as this to help them understand exactly what they need. So we have to go, we have to get ready for school. Use photographs to help divert, develop that nonverbal working memory for goal-directed future thinking. So take a picture of them, actually put those things, put these checklists on the side, just like this one shows. And what do they need? They need to have their headband, they need to have their sweatshirt and coat. And so it's a, a, a visual checklist that can go on the wall. It can be done with, you can laminate them and have it actually be a checklist every day so that they start remembering and start getting in the habit of doing things a certain way. Now, the one on the right-hand side of the screen here is one for a backpack. So what does it look like in your backpack? Here's their backpack. What do you actually need to have in the backpack to get ready before you go to school? And obviously you would modify this for older kids. So, um, they would have different, different things that they may need in the morning. They may have different things that they need. a school day checklist. So this is something that a teacher can use within the classroom. So again, this can actually be a checklist that you went put on a student's desk that's laminated or put it up by the wall when students walk in so they can see it. Um, you can actually have them check it off if you need to. So hang up the coat, open the backpack, et cetera. Letting students get into the routine of doing things the same way every time that they get to, to class. You may not start off with the same assignments. You may not start off with the same um, yeah, the same assignments are the same exact routine, but when they get to the class, the routine is basically the same. And so having a checklist for them um, is really helpful for them to get started on the right track and at least get things organized to begin with. Creating zones within your classroom, and this can actually be done at home as well. Creating zones within your classroom can help students think about where they're going to go next. So um, if it's really clear that this is the math area, this is the reading area, um, this is the homework collection bin. This is where backpacks go. This is where they can pick up materials and return materials. If students know exactly where those things are within your classroom, it can really help them develop those executive function skills because they get in the habit of doing things a certain way. So that organization kicks in. Those um, That planning and prioritizing kicks in so they can plan ahead. I'm in math now. I know that reading is next. So I can plan in my mind that I need to go to reading next. So they can kind of get that 
you start building those skills. And again, that can happen at, at any level. Making time visible. You wanna talk through the plan for the assignment. What is your 10 minute plan? Now, I recommend, and I got this originally from Sarah Wolf as well, is that um, using an analog clock, actually drawing on the clock, um, the amount of time needed for something to be completed. So you visibly mark the time on the clock by coloring in the full amount of time given for an assignment, and then taking a marker, a magnet, and putting at the halfway mark. Now this works well because for those students that um, have a difficult time initiating a task or have it or get a little bit sidetracked while they're in the middle of a task, something like that, they can see the passage of time. So that way you can check with them as the passage of time goes through and you can say, hey, we're halfway through the amount of time that we allotted for this project. Uh, where are you in the assignment? How many problems have you completed? Or have you gotten you know, your, your writing started? So it's really a way to help check in with students and keep them on track to get assignments completed. This works great at, at home as well to actually have timers and, and clocks in front of them, utilizing the halfway mark stop, to stop and check in with students to see where they're at and making sure that they're on track to get something completed. So making time visible, let them see what time looks like, what, how it's passing and analog clocks work great for that. I added some writing checklists on here. And this first one is just how to do informative writing. Again, having vis visuals in front of students can really help them to guide their, their process to get something completed. And that's at all levels. Um, this one is called inform. It's including that opening paragraph all the way down to make a closing paragraph that relates to the topic. So it's really having the process laid out in front of them so they can go step by step by step through it. Now you could turn this into a checklist if you if you thought that would be valuable. Um, all of these resources, uh, a lot of these resources can be found by just going to Pinterest, by going um, on, um, on um, Google. I mean, you can find a lot of these resources that you can utilize both at home or you can create your own, which is something that um, we've done a lot in the past as well. Um, an editing checklist, again, um, do my sentences begin with capital letters? So it, it seems like something very simple, but it helps our students that are struggling with executive functioning skills organize their thinking and get a project done that they may be having issues with. Um, and and um, again, these can be laminated so they can be reused over and over again. This is a simple way of understanding what you might need for getting a project done for the older students. It's called the SMART strategy. So it's basically, do you have the strategies, the sheets that you need to get them completed? Do you have your graphic organizer, your logo parts, and so forth as far as your strategies and sheets to understand what you need to get something completed? Do you have your materials? Do you have your markers, that sort of thing to get this, the um, assignment completed? Um, how about do you, what about your actions? Do you need to get a snack and water? Do you need to get up and wash your hands? Do you need to pick a partner? Do you need to cut out something? What type of resources might you need? Do you need a, another person? Do you need a partner within the classroom? Do you need to ask a teacher for clarification if you don't understand what it is? Do you need to ask for a ride to get poster board from your parents? What is it that you actually need to get this project completed? And then thinking about that technology, do you need a flashlight? Do you need your iPad? Do you need a laptop? And those kinds of things. So again, it's just a, a way to remember what organization pieces and what tools you might need to get a project completed. This tool is an afternoon tool um, to help students actually get home with their homework assignments in place and actually bring their lunch boxes home. So really to get out that red folder, get the papers out of the cubby, um, you can see the rest, you know, and, and finally get home, get your coat and, 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 and get home. The one on the right hand is actually pictures for a student. So you, actually, you can put that student's picture on there, write your homework down. What, what does it actually look like where they need to get there? 
homework out of the cubby? What does the cubby look like? What does that planner look like? What do they need to run on that planner? So they can actually visualize and do the step-by-step -step what needs to occur before they get home. So um, again, back to that, utilizing real photographs can really um, tie that connection in with the student with their actual stuff and the things that they have. And here's another one, a little bit more primary one, a bring home checklist. So they just remember to bring things home. We use this a lot of uh, having that folder. Um, so they have a homework folder. So these are the things that have to go home. So that you put li literally label the folder to do and to turn in, or you can even put a bring home or turn in, whatever. So you can use whatever labels work best for your, your students. Um, but have those candidates work handouts, worksheets, notes from class, forms for parents on one side, and that completed homework sign forms and letters to bring back to class on the other. So they always know my red folder is where I'm going to be taking out first thing when I get to the classroom to put my completed homework, my sign forms, my letters, and so forth home. And then when I get home, my family is going to ask for my red folder because that's where my handouts, my worksheets, my notes from class and forms for families are going to be located as well. So you always have that folder going back and forth. And again, I would put that folder on that checklist so you make sure it gets home. Homework planning. Now I have a couple of homework planning tools on here. Um, this one is, you can, this is something that can be filled out at, 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 at school. Um, so you want to fill that out with the teacher and make sure that you have everything planned to get that homework done without stressing out. And that's the key is homework shouldn't be this big stressful event. It should be become a routine if your child is expected to do homework. And it should be something that getting the assignment home shouldn't be the bigger, big stress out piece. It should be a routine thing for them to be getting done. And they may need someone to help them plan the homework at school to begin with to help get it home and get it successfully done and, and brought back. So on this one, you have the date, you have your planning coach if you need one, and it, that could be a peer. Maybe you have somebody helping you at school that's a peer helper. Um, so you have your subject and assignment, the things that you need to take home and at home what you might need and how much time you're going to do with this, who can help check it and where is it gonna go when it's done? And again, step-by-step, figuring all this out so that you can get it done successfully. Here's one that Lisa Van Gemmer put together from Gift a Guru. Um, again, a homework checklist and plan to help guide them through those pieces. Robbers is really, to, again, helping to identify the root cause for the time um, the robber will help, you know, the students remove and replan to focus on getting the task completed. So it's that self-evaluation, understanding who they are, what they might need to get something completed. It's really understanding themselves, so identify what the problem is, identify what the root cause is, and then going through that process of, of figuring out why is it occurring and then the tools that you might need to make that better, and then evaluating where that tool works. So you can go on with that. For large assignments, you want to break those assignments into chunks. Um, on this one, actually getting a large wall ca calendar and using sticky notes works. Um, you put it up on the wall. If the task doesn't get completed, you move that sticky note to the next one. That's a real visual reminder to a student that, wow, I have two things that need to be done today, whereas I only had one yesterday if I didn't get it done. So it helps them to understand what, it, um, what procrastination looks like. Uh, because that due date's not changing, and then have them do that self-talk. If I don't do this today, then how is that going to help me, or how, what am I going to do about that for tomorrow? So really doing that self-talk to make it happen to get this assignment completed. And I would add on this calendar too, those things that you know um, have to be there. So if you have appointments, or you have swim practice, or something like that after school, you might want to put that on the chart too, so they realize, yeah, I'm not going to be able to do it on that day if I put it off today. Here's another assignment plan from Lisa Van Gemmer. Um, same kind of thing. And then it really includes a lot of reflection. Did I invest the time the assignment deserved? Did I write neatly enough? So really doing that self-reflection so that you can um, do quality assignments. Okay, we're gonna go back here to that root cause. What is the problem? So really identifying what that problem is. Why is the problem occurring? 
talked a lot about some of those pieces. And then what can we do about it? What are some of those tools? What are some of those resources we can utilize to help, to teach, to get better with executive functioning skills, and then evaluating to see if that worked. Okay, hey, um, here's some of our resources. Um, um, they're here within the thing. So Sarah Ward, Lisa Van Gemmert, there's Smart Bucks Scattered by Peg Dawson. And then there's a variety of other resources that I've used. This executive skills questionnaire at the end here is um, a self-evaluation. So you can understand better what skills you have, good, what, what executive function skills maybe you might struggle with too, because that can help you to support your child or student at home. And then again, I'm Diana Caldera, the Gifted and Talented Resource Coordinator for Deaf Coast Schools in Colorado. And it's really been my pleasure to have you today. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Diana. That um, even though I talk to families and teachers and administrators a lot about that, it's so good to see some of these things and I always pull new things. It is awesome. So, okay, I am going to, we had, um, we had a question and, oh, and a comment, and I'm going to second this comment. Jennifer Webb said she loves the wall calendar with the sticky notes, might need one for myself. And I would definitely second that. I was actually making myself a note that might do that for all my summer stuff. Right, yeah. <laughs> And then um, the question came from Amy Stevens, and she says that my son's been working with a primitive reflex therapist, and she's so great about helping him and me understand that until his body is organized, he'll not be able to organize things himself. Um, so she's been working with him around integrating his reflexes, and now his EF skills are starting to come around. Um, okay. And then she's just wondering, she's like, after many EF tutors and teachers are saying, you need to buy into a system, you need to work on growth mindset, a lot of these other ones, um, and all the frustrations that go with being misunderstood, he's finally able to access his frontal lobe. So her question is, are these skills um, in many of these kids really able to be learned if their bodies are not ready? And she said, it's an interesting experiment in their house. And I was thinking that that's a good question. And, you know, I'd love to hear your take. And that, that, that's a really good question. And, and, and honestly, I would, I would, I would think that no, it is developmental, like with most skills that we're learning. Um, I'm definitely not an expert. At, oops, sorry. My light went out. Didn't, I'm definitely not an expert on that on that piece or the therapy that your son's getting, which I'm so glad it's working. I'm really happy to hear that. Um, I mean, but my, based on my own experience, I would say that it is developmental and there are definitely some things that are gonna be, um, once their frontal lobe is more developed, they're going to be able to handle better. But think about all the adults, you know, with poor executive function skills. So, so that said, it's definitely something that can be taught and can be supported from very early. Um, I do have within this presentation, which I didn't show tonight, a video from Harvard um, about uh, with preschool kids in it and how they um, talk about that developmental piece. So when this gets posted on our website, go back and take a look at that. I think you'll enjoy that video on um, from Harvard on um, developing those executive function skills at preschool age. So it is possible to teach them and, and help grow those skills at that age. And I would totally agree. And I also think that sometimes the scaffolding and how we um, how we chunk up the the experiences also has a lot to do with it. So, well, very awesome. Okay, I'm just double checking to make sure I didn't miss anything else. Lots of thank yous. Oh, can you recommend some EF books, please? And I know you had some at the end of your, on your resource page. I do. I really like, um, I mean, it's been around a long time, but Smart Foot Scattered is a really good one. Um, if it's a teenager, um, Train Your Brain for Success is a teenager's guide to executive function. It's by Randy Coleman, K-U-L-M-A-N. Um, Late, lost, and unprepared is a, this, I'll have to fix my, my PowerPoint here. Um, late, lost, and unprepared is a parent's guide for helping um, students with, with um, executive function skills. I just realized my slide was wonky, sorry. Um, but that's another one. That one's by Joyce Cooper Kahn. Um, so it's really for parents helping, helping to teach your children. 
about executive function skills and then executive functions, how they work and why they evolved. Um, that's more of a, a understanding executive functions, um, whereas some of those other ones are really more hands-on and what you can do with your kids and practice with your kids. As well. Awesome. Well, thank you. Oh my goodness. This has reminded me of all the things that I actually need to do with myself and my almost grown children. So. <laughs> um, I love, I just wanted to bring up the, um, your, that it's learned and we need to practice it. I love that you, you kept mentioning that and you had so many wonderful different things that you can do that self-talk being so important. And um, I used to use when I was in the classroom forever ago, those time robbers that the yeah. kids. And you know, I have found, uh, I mean, being in the classroom for, I was in the classroom for many years. I mean, myself, my own self-talk really saying it out loud. Oh, I need to do this. And oh, this is going to take me so much time as an adult doing that self-talk in front of students and modeling modeling what your your thought process are to get something completed oh we i know that we're going to have to do this in 10 minutes that therefore i need to get blah 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 done now so really modeling that self-talk um utilizing your watch as an adult look at your watch oh we have 10 minutes to get somewhere so we need to get this done now so really thinking about that modeling piece is important as well for students Oh, thank you for mentioning that. That's so true. Yeah, the modeling. And sometimes we get in a hurry and we forget, but it's it's so important for them to, you know, see what it looks like. A lot of times we don't demonstrate great executive function skills as adults. So the best we can, we can model them for students and children, the better. <laughs> exactly. It'll help us too. Oh my goodness. Well, I think that's it for our questions. And I appreciate you taking the time from beautiful Oregon. And um, it was lovely to see you. And mm -hmm. I wanted to just give a quick shout out. Um, next week's will be again, Michelle Barkmeyer. And she is the gifted educational regional consultant for the West Central region of Colorado, and she's the Uncompadre um, BOCES gifted coordinator. Ooh, that's a mouthful, and I'm not sure if I said it right. <laughs> so she has also had a lot of experience as a parent and a professional, and um, so I would just say tune in next week as well. But I am so excited, and I need to go back and take notes on on Diana's. And I appreciate you spending so much time with us, and we will talk to you soon. So I'm heading off of Facebook and we will talk to you all next week.